All right, so like probably most commercial beekeepers today, um, I was born into it basically. Um, and that's why I started with my birthday, or when I was born, 1983. Um, my father was not a full-time commercial beekeeper on his own at that time. He was mostly working for Mitchell Brothers Honey. And both Russell and Norman were um, the owners of Mitchell Brothers Honey, and they were third generation beekeepers. And uh, Rus Russell had a son, Bill, who eventually bought out both his dad and his uncle. And so my father spent most of his time um, when I was growing up working for Bill uh, and a little bit with Norman because he was a little bit younger than um, Russell and didn't retire as soon. So basically, um, my dad was working for a commercial beekeeper. He was actually going to be a teacher. He decided, I'm going to keep with the bees as long as they pay me more and they agreed to pay him more. So he stopped uh, doing student teaching and he became a full-time beekeeper. Um, and then over the years, he started you know, just accumulating smaller beekeeping operations and built up to about um, 600 hives on his own. And I apologize now, I don't have a lot of photos that correlate with the timeline. All these photos are from like two, two days of shooting recently, um, but I will talk about them a little bit, but it's mostly just to have something, you know, pleasing to look at. Uh, so yeah, I'll just keep going. So I already kind of talked about this. When I turned 12, I was legally able to work in agriculture. Um, even though I had already been working, I could now work full time and they couldn't get, or my dad and Bill couldn't get in trouble. So when I turned 12, I started extracting every summer. And at that time, Bill was operating about 2,200 hives. And so when harvest season started, it was usually sometime early July and finished end of August, sometimes into September and we would harvest or there'd be two trucks out harvesting and then a crew extracting and we would extract seven days a week. Um, and then it got better <laughs> as I got older. Um, by high school I was helping all the time when I wasn't in school whether it was during school season or summer um, and so I started you know, getting experience in the, in the bees, uh, not just extracting honey. So it started becoming more fun. Um, I, my freshman year, I went to Wisconsin first semester. After the, when I started the second semester, I decided to drop out and I went back to the University of Montana and enrolled there. I, I, okay, I should say transfer. I transferred back to the University of Montana, went there for a total of four semesters. And um, during that time, I started working pretty much full-time, even when I was in college. Uh, if I wasn't in class and I could be out helping, I was. Jim, and what was wrong with Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, actually. I had personal issues. I, it was just a very rough time for me. It was a rough time for me. Um, my head was in a bad place. And, and I wanted to save about $40,000. OK, I'll start talking about these pictures a little bit. So most of these are pictures of me inspecting my four uh, Wolf Creek packages I bought last year. Um, because I was so determined to finally get some small cell comb, I decided to try everything. Um, so, yeah, and then the apple tree that got killed off this fall by some rodent who ate all the bark off the bottom of the tree. Um, my dad and Bill were not treatment-free. 
My dad did a lot of reading of the American Bee Journal. Um, he was this describer. And so we were exposed to some of the things, alternatives, good ideas, bad ideas, that other beekeepers were doing. And he really wanted to do um, the hygienic program uh, to help with um, disease resistance, mostly for Varroa. Um, so we did that for about a total of five years, where we did the whole liquid nitrogen, froze the brood, picked out uh, supposedly hygienic mother colonies, and then raised usually about 100 to 150 nooks and, and requeened them with those um, queens we grafted and raised. At the time, they had switched to formic and apigard or thymol um, because before that they were using kumafos or whatever and then it stopped working and they were kind of scrambling so they went to formic and um, so that's, that's where my experience was. Thankfully, I wasn't in the bees really when they were using the kumafos and the other stuff. Um, I'd heard about Dee Lesby, read a little bit about her, first in the American Bee Journal. Um, I got bored with the University of Montana. I wasn't living on campus. I was working off campus. I made a handful of friends in class that never actually became good close friends. And I realized that even though I was saving money, I was wasting my v golden years. So I went back to Northland College. <laughs> That first semester at Northern College, I had a great experience. It, you know, I didn't have a bad experience in Wisconsin. Um, so in perspective, after going to the University of Montana, I was like, I do want the college experience. Um, I do want a good education. So I went back to Northland. Not that you can't get a good education at the University of Montana. <laughs> um, in a sustainable agriculture class, we had to do a research paper, so of course I chose Veromites. This is another Wolf Creek um, package. Came across D again, went deeper into Michael's stuff, because um, it was free online, and he seemed to be very thorough in his research. Um, I, so I was exposed to small cell and all the treatment-free stuff in a limited dose. Um, and that's where I was. I had a few colonies. I'd sold most of the original 25. I kept only the ones I raised natural queens out of. So I uh, w sold most of them, was down to eight. Um, and when I was away in college, someone else managed them for me using Formic, Thymol, and um, Thailand. <clears throat> this is the picture of what I thought was my one feral colony I got as removal. It's actually a swarm that moved in a couple days later, so when I removed it, it had comb about that big. Just really tiny little thing, already had eggs in it. They were darker, they looked a little smaller, I was so excited. And so this is the first time I actually inspected these bees. Um, they only had filled up the top box. I put a box underneath because I figured I wouldn't be back till April after almond pollination would be over and I didn't want an early season to cause them to swarm. So that's the reason for the extra box. 2011 uh, was kind of a formative year for me. Um, 2010, my brother had moved back to Montana from living in Maine. He went to school in Bar Harbor. And uh, I had those few colonies. I took all the honey I um, made from those colonies and went down to the farmer's market and sold the honey. At that point, I had realized there's a difference between raw honey and conventional honey. So I was selling and educating my um, customers that my honey was better and worth more. And after I'd sold all of my honey after two markets, I decided maybe I should get more bees and I conned my brother <laughs> into starting Listener Brothers Honey with myself. And uh, yeah, I had been reading, doing more research about treatment free. Um, I wasn't completely sold on the small cell yet. 
So, and mostly because my dad and Bill were like, oh, they said that, they figured out that doesn't work. Well, sometimes I take their word too seriously. Um, the kept hive in horrible locations is my excuse or my reasoning for why the weavers didn't perform as well as they should have. And um, because they didn't perform well, my dad and my brother both said they're worthless. They're not, you know, they're not mite resistant. Um, you can't keep them treatment free. They gave up. Um, they started treating all the weavers. And at that time, they were both my brother and my hives. So there was no separation in their hives. So there was a lot of compromising going on. Um, yeah, we tried wintering uh, the winter of 2011, 2012. We overwintered half of our colonies um, without treating them in the fall because I was convinced we had some good genetics and we lost over 50% that winter. And at that point, my brother stopped wanting to do treatment free or even trying it. And where, there we go. This is another, um, Wolf Creek Colony that I took a bottom tray and converted to a lid with the top entrance because Michael Bush was talking about top entrances and I wanted to experiment. And this actually was one of the hives that made it through winter. I don't know if it's still alive. So after all the hours and hours of trying to find middle ground with my brother, I decided to split off. I started Sapphire Permaculture Apiary. Um, that year I had over 80 colonies. I think it was over 90 colonies. Um, I stopped treating for mites, cold turkey. Um, a lot of them made it through the first year, um, but most of them died. Actually, all of them died. The only ones that I have kept treatment free um, more than 18 months were the weavers. Um, 2013, I bought 20, I think 20 weavers. Most of them were accepted in my nooks. And at the end of the season, I probably go into this, but um, I had fairly high losses, but I didn't treat. I didn't feed anything but um, honey. And it seemed like it was working. Um, I started making splits um, trying to increase the numbers, but I made multiple mistakes in doing so, and um, I didn't make up the losses. What do you mean by weavers? Yeah, good question. I'm sorry. Um, so, Bee Weaver is one of the sons of the original famous weavers in Texas. Um, there might have been two sons working together. I, I don't know the detail. Dee probably knows better. Anyway, they had 5,000 colonies. They wanted to go treatment free. They let 2,500 of them die and they ended up with like, I don't know, 200 or less colonies or something around there. And then once they were able to build up that 2,500 from those survivors, they let the other half go. And then once all those died, they build up. And then now since what, 2000 or something, they've been selling queens and bees, advertising chemical free. And so at that point, that was the only place I really knew I could get those type of bees. Um, but they're from Texas. Um, I had read Dee's book online, and I was convinced I could do a shakedown. And I did one as an experiment. I, was, I waited till a strong honey flow because I took all of their combs away and put them all on small cell foundation, but they were 5.4 bees and they didn't drop properly and they died. Just make sure I'm not skipping anything. Um, they probably starved, um, but 
at the same time, their comb was just so erratic and messed up, I don't even think they could lay well. 2014, went crazy trying to make more hives since all of mine pretty much died in 2013. And I do kind of rely on them for my income. Um, not kind of, I do rely on them. Uh, I do work for my dad and other beekeepers and that keeps me going. If I didn't have another job, I wouldn't be making a living off treatment-free bees. Um, I finally got some 5.1 foundation. I started introducing it in a lot of different ways, either as whole boxes or just a frame or two dropped into um, the center of the brood nest. I also did lots of foundationist foundationless frames and almost all of them when they drew a worker brood frame uh, drew 5.4 even foundationless and maybe that's because they're just going off the size of all the other combs in the hive. Um, made some nooks and splits from weavers but nothing that um, really made it. As you can see in this picture now I mark all the frames, all new frames, with the size of foundation, the direction of the housel positioning, and the year, and my name, so no one can steal my bees. <laughs> Started trying to catch swarms in 2015, um, as I did more research, and I realized I need better genetics, locally adapted, and I was wanting to find feral colonies, as I had seen some wild honeybees in the wilderness. I do like to hunt, fish, backpack, so I do run into um, honeybees in the mountains occasionally. Not often, but I do see them. Um, so that's when I started trying to catch swarms. Um, I didn't do a good job getting them far enough away from <laughs> other commercial operations, so pretty much all the swarms I caught were from those operations. I finally got some PF100s because I was sick of seeing all my nice 4.9 wax foundation get turned into just basically honey frames. Um, finally started to see some hives draw out 5.1 correctly, although it was still rare. It was still not the majority. Um, and then I, like an occasional 4.9. Um, this is mostly going into a range of 30 to 40 colonies. Um, I didn't try to reduce any, or I didn't have enough equipment to try to regress any more than that. Another Wolf Creek package that I probably didn't need to add a second box and maybe I killed it in doing so. <clears throat> like I said, caught some swarms, pretty much all commercial, they were all from commercial bees as far as I know. It's hard to say. Um, finally bought some honey supercell because even the PF 100s were usually not being drawn correctly. And even though I had a few frames of the PF 100s drawn correctly, for some reason those bees always died. So um, I wanted to get small cell bees, get on the road. And, tr and my theory was if I get down to small cell hives, I can better interbreed with the feral colonies. But then foul brood showed up. Um, I don't want to say where it came from or, or what I think, but I do feel that commercial beekeepers, when they treat proactively for foul brood every year, you're not getting rid of the spores. You're just getting rid of a, you know, of a bunch of infected brood. And that if you're using old commercial combs, even though they maybe not, don't have foul brood or you can't see it, there's still the potential for foul brood to show up, especially if you start ripping over, open old brood frames. I don't know that's where the foul brood came from, um, but that's, that's what happened. I had seen foul brood before in Dad and Bill's hives. Um, I still didn't want to treat with uh, Thailand, so um, I didn't for a lot of them. Ended up losing a lot of them. All of them that I lost, I ended up burning the equipment. And then decided to buy small cell bees, even if they weren't treatment free. 
Another picture of the swarm removal I did that I thought was my feral colony. As you can see, they actually put up, put up a lot of honey. Um, I made a lot of mistakes with this hive too, even though I thought it was my baby. Um, and you can see that's my hive tool I'm using to measure the small cell comb. 2017, um, started getting more combs drawn out co correctly. Um, I made splits mostly because a lot of my um, hives had the large cell comb on top, the 5.1 or 4.9 underneath. So I could, if I could make a split, I could get all the um, old comb off and try to get them, you know, completely away from the old combs. Um, once at the end of the season, I could um, distinguish hives that didn't have any old frames from ones that did, I started separating them out and I moved them into two different yards. The one removal when I measured the comb was 5.2. Um, so I was hoping they were gonna be smaller than that, but I was still hopeful um, they're feral or regressing bees. Um, I said likely from a beekeeper, not a wild hive. I don't really know that, um, but I'm guessing they are, they, they might be. Um, yeah, I made sure to weed out the old combs. Another picture of me measuring and my partner, Shannon, she's wonderful. She took a man lake um, hive tool, the, the kind I've been using recently, found a, an engraver and had a birthday present made up for me where it had my idea of a ruler on the, on the side of the hive tool so I wouldn't have to break out a different ruler. Yeah? You should make those and sell them on Etsy. Yeah, yeah there's lots of things I should do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, right? I should patent it and claim it's my idea, but I'm sure someone else has already done it. And yeah, I'm trying to limit myself and all the different things I try to get into because I have a tendency to spread myself thin. Yeah, someone else, do it. Just, just say I had the great idea at first. And <laughs> um, yeah, but works really good. Works really nice. Um, don't have to remember to bring the ruler. Um, I didn't get, as you can see, to the center of the brood nest. I was really concerned I might hurt the queen because they didn't build um, the combs perfectly uh, in the frame. They're kind of at a slight angle. So I didn't want to dig too deep being so late in fall. Well, it wasn't really late in the fall, but I thought if I killed the queen, it might be a bad time for her to mate because they, a lot of colonies had already st started kicking out drones. So I just measured a couple frames in, and the smallest I got was 5.2. Um, maybe I'll measure the center of the brood nest this year. So at the time I was putting this together all in a hurry, um, I had two out of the four Wolf Creek colonies still alive, no treatments. Five of the 10 um, hives that actually were off old combs and it seemed like they had quite a bit of small cell comb in them, um, seemed to be still alive without fall treatments. Those colonies that they came from all were treated in the spring um, just for mites with a formic. And now I need a lot more advice because, um, yeah, I need, okay, need a strong word. Let me back up. I want to be a treatment-free commercial beekeeper I would like to show that it's possible for others, but also just for myself. I don't like treating. I, and I believe, you know, that it can be done. I can do it. Other people are doing it. Um, but I need to get up to like 500 hives. And this is just to cover my area that I have for locations and for me to make a living. Um, I could probably make a living off fewer hives, but I feel 
if I can have more hives, it'll be easier for me to make a living. I won't have to do as many value-added products. I won't have to sell, you know, um, a bunch of things. I can just sell honey, beeswax, a couple things, and make a comfortable living. And I like working lots of hives. There's another shot of me measuring that feral comb. A little closer, she had my name printed on there with a comb pattern. I hang it on the wall and I only use it for my treatment free colonies. Exactly. I mean, I'm, I know treatment free colonies that can um, handle foul brood on their own. Once I get there, it won't be a big deal. But ever since like burning a third of my equipment, I've been paranoid. Um, so yeah, so that's part of the reason for the disposable gloves as well. You have to understand if I buy a pair of gloves and I go work for three different large cell commercial beekeepers, I get a little concerned about, not really concerned, but I just am trying to be a little more hygienic even in my own practices. Um, can't hurt, right? This is my horrible idea. Maybe it's not so horrible but probably did most damage to this hive. I, after being here last year and hearing Michael talk about top bar, or not, not top bar, but top entrances, um, I started coming up with crazy ideas. I decided to drill an entrance in the lid and obviously to protect from it getting rain or snow directly down the brew nest, I built a little half dome shelter. And they seem to really like it, but I don't think it was the best idea. Um, I think it might have been a little large for the new colony. Uh, you'll be able to see the size of the hole. It's only about a quarter or an inch and a quarter. Um, but yeah, they dwindled considerably. And then if you look at the other um, pictures, you can see they put all the honey as far away from the entrance as possible. And I feel that having a bottom entrance might be really good in cold climates because then they're going to put the honey more like a cap on the top and not off to the side where it will be easier to keep them warm and for them to eat it in the winter. Your, your observation of the bees organizing the stuff inside the hive relative mm -hmm. to the position of the entrance mm -hmm. is Yeah. And I think top entrances definitely can change the organization of the hive. I often see pollen in my top box near my upper entrance when I have one, but if I don't, the top box often gets full of honey. Mm -hmm. so something about hoarding a pollen location relative to entrance is mm -hmm. important. Yeah. As well. So for, sure. for people who want to pull supers and harvest, you're pulling potentially supers with fruit and pollen, not pure honey. So they think you can make a difference. Yeah. But remember, your upper entrance doesn't have to be at the top of your hive. Um, right. I've been working a lot now with entrances kind of between the top box and the box below it. For sure. Or an entrance at the top and then you super above that. And so you can manipulate these things quite a lot. Yeah. To think about what the bees are going to do relative to the entrance. Yeah. And I have a little experimental nature, so I was just trying a bunch of yeah, so things. Did you consider your wind direction? Because, you know, we Of course, down, yeah. So you know that the cold wind would probably blow and then down to the brood chamber. Um, <laughs> yes, I definitely was thinking about airflow and wind. I positioned it out of the wind. Um, I get little bits of information from all sorts of places. Uh, the Sundance pollen traps came with a little piece of paper and they're like, these are for the top of a hive using top entrances or what is normally found in nature. I don't know where they pulled that from, probably just out of themselves, but it got me uh, thinking, you know, okay, I saw this bee tree in Arizona, yeah, it's a totally different climate, but basically the entrance is straight down over the top and it's a very large entrance. And I was thinking if I'm having problems with um, 
too much moisture in the hive in the winter, maybe this would mitigate it. That was my rationale. Um, yeah, I didn't think it through too far. <laughs> um, me digging in the hive. As you can see, they're a little darker, um, or definitely darker than the stock I was getting from my father. No, I, I don't use any inner covers, and that's just me. I know that um, it's a commercial beekeeping thing, and maybe I'll start using inner covers, but I don't think it's necessary. What do you think? You think it's necessary? Of course, our problem is heat, not cold, but uh, all my hives have a little two-inch uh, board that's got uh, you know uh, number four mesh on the bottom but below that um, a little key upper entrance and then ventilation holes and then I fill it up with excelsior or, or wood chips or something um, and all my hives came through the winter so yeah. it seemed, it seemed to help. yeah all of Bill, he still overwinters two thirds of his two thirds of his outfit, or six to seven hundred hives. He uses commercial flat lids. Doesn't seem to affect his overwintering ability. And it, I try to think about what do you find in nature. Well, you don't find an inner cover in nature. You find all sorts of cavities. Well, cavities don't have inner covers usually, I don't think it should be a big deal. I don't even know why people use inner covers. Can you tell me? Control moisture content. <coughs> and by a con, huh? You know you're gonna get a little different answers. Yeah, I know, but no one's ever explained it to me. I've never found it on the internet. The inner cover is supposed to be so you can take the telescoping lid off and it won't be prop light stamped. Yeah. yeah, so I don't have telescoping so, lids. Yeah, for sure. And they seem to work for me. For me, the moisture is more of a problem in the winter. So mm -hmm. uh, having that upper entrance in that inner cover and then the hole in the center, when you put the lid on, there can be airflow circulating from the bottom entrance out the top all the mm -hmm. time. For sure. But you could do that in theory without an inner cover, right? But it's not just about a top entrance. There's also the hole in the lid that allows the complete circuit. The inner cover has a hole. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know. But a lot of people close that hole up. D. Mm -hmm. You can use it for uh, piggybacking hives for making, for overwintering wheat hives over strong yeah. hives to keep them building up with honey and pollen throughout the winter plus the warmer from the heat below from yeah. the plus you can use it for emergency bottom boards for uh, setting hives down and going through the yard so you can super on up mm -hmm. and go, go for the crop too. Yeah. Yeah, I might make some inner covers, but. Mm -hmm. Some of these other things were things people adapted along the way with. Mm -hmm. like, well, if you use more ventilation, so you start putting notches in the inner cover. That's a fairly recent thing, really. Yeah. I mean, they weren't putting notches in their covers when I started at all. Um, the hole in the top was mostly to put a bee escape on, and that's why, they, that's why it's that stupid oblong thing that there's no value for putting the jar on. <laughs> but I mean, it's yeah. a jar on it, but it doesn't fit right. Um, if I make any of them, which I haven't any more, I don't make them, but when I did make them, I put a round jar lid size hole and screen it, and I could put a feeder on it and mm -hmm. use it. Yeah. So, so some of these were afterthoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our uses for it, but they weren't the original plan. Yeah. The plan just to get a double wall so that there was an airspace so there would be less condensation. Yeah. So it's kind of evolved over time. And I'm sure. And other yeah. And I might eventually try some inner covers. Maybe I'll do it this year. But 
I really like keeping hives as simple as possible um, and having as little equipment as possible, especially when you start running hundreds of hives. It saves you money and time. I'm not totally for or against inner covers. I'm just, I've never used them. Well, so you're looking for a really good reason to use them that would provide you with an advantage. Yeah, if I saw a bunch of beekeepers with inner covers having a lot better success rate over wintering than those people without, then I'd more, I'd consider it probably st more strongly, but I, I, I've mostly experienced with just flat covers and I, I don't see a lot of moisture problems in the beekeepers that I am working with. And I've got a different climate too. I have a very dry climate. Um, we get less than 13 inches of um, precipitation annually. Um, so, yeah, maybe I just don't have to worry about it. I don't know. But I'm, I'm totally open to more reasons and suggestions of why I should do inner cover. So do you have conversation issues at all? Um, rarely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bill keeps most of his hives um, on a slight angle towards the entrance. So if there is any condensation, it's not dripping directly on the cluster, it's running out. So. And a lot of people say, well, you need to have your hive perfectly level, and I think that's silly, personally. I, I mean, maybe if you're doing foundationless, there's a good reason for it. Yeah, that's not front to back, so that even then, yeah. But, um, so yeah, I just, I'm not wor too worried about it yet, but maybe I should be. I was gonna say, with our level of humidity, if we don't have the hives, Level four. Wayne does the leveling for me, and I'm always going. To, you did remember to do it forward just a bit. We we lost a hive because of moisture. It was mm. some sort of problem at the corner of the hive. I don't know whether they didn't propolis it in, or we didn't get it just right. Something, and so we're very careful. With with our last fall, we had a northeast with brings wind and rain in great volume. Then we had a hurricane with a great volume of water, and then we had another northeaster on top of it, and it put water and land, covered water yeah. deeper than we'd ever seen. So if your environment, you're not worried about moisture, I don't know, I would, I would do flat migratory covers or whatever, as long as it didn't leak. But I find that we're gonna need that double protection in our environment. For sure, yeah. I'm definitely a lot different than most climates in this country. You, you said that your target uh, was 500 colonies, kind of an ideal trajectory. How are you thinking about uh, dealing with um, colony deaths during the winter? It looks like that's when big events happen for you. And you've had 50, well, the family history includes 50% mortality during the winter. So are you just targeting 500 and hoping to live with 250, or is there no. a strategy in uh, terms of expanding the area of keeping bees? The 50% loss rate was from not treating bees, not overwintering. Um, I figure once I have healthy bees that can um, do what they're doing. I'm expecting a 5 to 20 percent loss rate like Solomon is experiencing and that is normal and historical, historically an average kind of. If I can get to that, um, if I, even if I lost two, a third, I think I would easily be able to make all of them up every year making nooks, splits maybe, when uh, we have had bad years in the past where Dad and Bill have lost over a third, um, we've made them up every spring out of nooks. And that's what they do. They, they call them, 
Um, people call them different things, but it's basically you pull some brood, shake it off, throw a queen excluder, slap it, there's four frames of brood in that new box you set on top, come back next day, pull it off. Um, we'll make 150, sometimes 200 in a day, so with a crew of like five people, but it's, it's fairly easy, or I'm fairly confident in creating new colonies out of strong ones, as long as they're healthy. This is my bee hut, which is a permaculture um, concept, kind of, uh, or at least it's really popular in the perma permaculture circles. The idea is keep the rain off the hive, let the sun in uh, all year in the winter, except for the summer when the sun is the highest, it gives a few hours of shade. Um, so I put this hive in there because it was unoccupied. All the bees that have been in there in the past. And this was just like my prototype. I, you know, you can see my construction is caveman-like. <laughs> I don't measure stuff when I'm building stuff for animals. I just slap it together because I figure they don't care. I, I, well, unless it's a beehive. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know if it really um, does anything beneficial except keep them dry. But there it is. There's another shot of the feral colony, and you, you can see the honey is packed up the, here, and the entrance was over here. They put on a lot of honey and pollen, and that, I was so impressed. This is a quick, rough shot, I don't know why it's even in here, um, of me working one of my hives. Um, not in my house. These are um, 5.4 bees. Not that you can see the bees here, but uh, you can kind of see my, some of my bear fence. This is my most recent bear fence. Usually we set T posts and do barbed wire and electrify the barbed wire um, alternating strands that keeps out the bears. This is up Rock Creek, um, which is now my new territory. And as you can see, this is a rock jack post. I didn't, po I didn't pound any posts into this because it's just basically a, a, a old gravel bar of nice big rocks. So those actually worked pretty well. Um, one thing I... Uh, so it's a kind of like a tripod fence post. There's one post, two little legs going off, and then some cross members to hold the rocks, and you weigh it down with the rocks, and then things can't push over your fence post. But you don't have to pound a post into the ground or dig a hole, which is, would be infuriating in this. And I'm actually probably gonna go to these types of fences for almost all my yards, because most yards are very difficult to pound posts, in, and we usually do it with a post pounder by hand. And I've built probably about 40 or 50 bare fences, and I don't like doing it. And so I just set in these four corner rock jacks, and then I just have um, the plastic step and posts. And I use smooth wire now because I don't like barbed wire. It looks like your veils are metal screen. Or tell me a little bit about what you're wearing. Um, well, in the previous slides, I was wearing Shannon's jacket, which is the Brushy Mountain um, veil. I can't remember remember what they call this one it's like clear view pro whatever it's the 50 60 dollar veil um, other commercial beekeepers turned me on to this we used to use the square box style veils I really like these um, this is not metal it's like a it looks like metal screen but I think it's it's actually plastic it's it's rigid but flexible so like you can push on it and it won't and it'll pop back out to the original form and then there's a you know a plastic tube around here in the top and bottom keeps it in a nice shape and i love them cool cool yeah and i i do have a a catalog I could point out to you if you want the exact name. Um, 
but yeah, I've gone to these and I won't buy anything else. I mean, it's like 360 view. You can see a lot better. Um, they're great. I don't like the zip up jackets. I like the strings tie because as you can see, I like to dress up when I'm beekeeping. <laughs> what am I wearing? I'm, this is what I wear when I beekeep, except usually long sleeve. And then if I'm worried about getting stung a lot, I'll wear gauntlets, but I usually just use leather gloves now. Um, Carhartt pants. That's my fancy new Western shirt I love enough to ruin in the bees. Um, you can see division board or frame feeder, whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't like them, but I'm still using them and to the point I actually have plenty of um, feed honey and they're, they're in mostly my conventional hives. Um, I think this is the last photo. Oh, so this is what I've come up with in terms of how the heck am I going to increase my numbers when I only have a handful of small cell hives and um, who knows if any of them will survive. Um, I'm open to more ideas. I do have tons of old coal boxes that dad and Bill will sort out usually because they're rotting because we keep all our hives on four-way pallets. So you almost always get after a few years, the bottom side of the box right here to rot out because it's sitting right next to another one. So I literally probably have access to a couple hundred of these. So I'm going to start using them as swarm traps. And my goal is to set a hundred and hope that I can catch just a handful. Have you ever been taught how to cut that bottom out with the uh, table saw and then put another piece of wood back in and, and fix it using the accordion passage? Um, I haven't been taught that. And I would be um, open to that. I actually want to go away from pallets eventually and back to all bottom boards, which will reduce the rot. Um, what we have been doing for these, because it's usually only two or three inches, we've been just sawing off the entire bottom and use them as uh, mediums. We use seven and five eighths for mediums, but then we use those as honey supers. And I'll probably just do that mostly or just cut it out, patch it up, and use it as a swarm trap. Uh, in, in our experience, <coughs> we, you know, you know, we have one box, okay, and now we basically have a philosophy of one. If you have one box of bee, we call it a baby hive. Mm -hmm. okay. But we found that success, uh, we began having success when we had four deep boxes and then five deep. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I'm just wondering if you would consider the fact that it would take 105 deep for your, you know, as, as, a, as a future outlook, 125 four deep boxes instead of one, you know, one or two just, you know, a, you know, a baby box or, a, you know, or something. Consider that. For swarm traps? No. For your actually, your oh. 500 high. Oh, yeah. No, I plan, I plan to get three deeps. I don't really like anything but deeps, and I'll probably eventually have only deeps. Um, three deeps for the brood nest, two deeps for the honey supers. I will even put more on top of that if I think so. But I haven't gotten to that point yet. Yes, and we found out that once we got the small cell, you know, the small cell, that's, that, that's the goal. Yeah, for sure. And, and we, we did use the super cell, mm -hmm. and now we find out if we have to do a split or something, we put, we put first, you know, we put first super cell in the, in the, in the middle, mm -hmm. and make sure we put the uh, frames, we do frame, box our frame on each side, and then the key is to pack it, you know, the, the three, three honey mm -hmm. inside. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. And I'm totally a believer in that. Um, I've been in transition, so yes. even when I've been introducing the honey supercell. Um, you put your transition on the outside. Yeah. The, they'll, a lot of times it'll take them a year to yes. <laughs> want to move over. So, The only thing that stands out to me as problematic is the requeening. 
Uh, I think the the road forward for you will be making queens from what you already have that's surviving. Yes. Uh, and that may for you, yeah. uh, the seasons and things, that may, may involve trying to find a someone who can make queens for you somewhere or somewhere else earlier in the season and you like ship you or something. Get that process going so that you can because requeening is you, whatever if you have some a bunch, you know, some of the hives that survived and then you requeen them then you just lost whatever you discovered. And so yeah. if you're if you're working with the stuff that you already have and it would be better even to split from there and add queens from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. For sure. My idea was to not kill the queens, okay. but steal the queens, right? And introduce them to other nooks or other colonies. So I'm not actually losing the genetics and then actually introducing them into more hives, but um, speeding up the rate at which I get to mostly local genetics. Yeah. That's my reasoning. How reason. easy is it to raise your queens in your I don't have a problem with it. I mean, after my experience grafting and raising queens, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to doing that. I might actually do that if I want to produce a lot of queens. Um, but usually I'm just making nooks and letting them raise their own. And it's, I have usually a 90% success rate or greater. Is this one of the things that I've seen common among people who have transitioned either from commercial or treating to treatment free? is raising their own queens. Uh, Sam Comfort would be a good example of that. He started off as a kid in commercial bees like you did, mm -hmm. and starting off by grafting and raising his own queens and, and expanding from there. And, and I've, done, I've done the same thing. It seems to me that that is one solid. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, yeah, I, I overthink this part too much. Um, but yeah, you're, what you're suggesting is a great idea and, and probably the I don't know the best way, but one of the better ways to go about it. I've got a question. Um, how, has anybody done the math? How many cells in a small cell medium, for, call it 4.9, versus how many cells in a standard cell D? <clears throat> Number of cells for your area. Has anybody done that math? I'm pretty sure it's, in the it's like it's like four. It's like forty percent more or something. It's a big difference. The math is outlined how to do it. How it's set up with rhomboid squares and the different measurement styles. You'll find you have to do it. I'm just wondering. You get about as many bees in a medium small cell as you do in a regular deep with the five point. Yeah. Are you looking at similar numbers? That's probably a pretty good comparison. Cell number You're looking at in just one suit or all a difference in making an extra pound of beans. So you're looking at every brood cycle, a two to three pound difference in no, beans, which means numbers. the difference in honey crops. It's more smaller bees versus less larger bees. Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, small cell on a medium where you're throwing as many bees into the forest per, per uh, box as you are with, with large cell meat. Uh, yeah, but you can't just look at yeah. the number of bees, because the bees are two-thirds the mass of a large cell bee, but they, they, they can fly faster and they live longer. There's a fair amount of research that says that smaller bees simply live longer, so they collect more honey. So you got more bees that can't collect as much honey per trip, but can do more trips over their lifetime. You know, the difference of eight trips in one day with smaller versus maybe five on average for the large no one's if it's close. S small cell comb makes perfect sense to me. I'm not, you don't have to convince me. My dad does a good job uh, promoting commercial beekeeping and their ideals and their non-logic. I say, oh, I want small cell bees. And he says, I don't want small bees. I want big bees to make more honey. It's the same, it's, it's just, that's as far as their logic goes.
Yeah. So if you're in Stevensville and I happen to see maybe a mountain in the background, so you're right up along the coast way in Montana, could you tell me something about the honey and olive plants? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'll try to do this quickly because I could go on this forever. My favorite plant in the world is knapweed and it's an invasive species in my area. It's later blooming honey or flower and the honey is amazing if you've never tasted it. I've got samples back there. You, sh you need to taste it before you leave. We've got agriculture in the valleys. The mountains, I'm surrounded by mountains. We're in mountain valleys. And in the valley, there's still some hay. There's clover, dandelion. Um, we've got uh, other noxious weeds, like leafy spurge that produce a lot of honey. In the mountains, it's mostly bushes, um, perennials, uh, herbs, and, uh, and some fireweed. But fireweed is not, I've never gotten a crop of fireweed. Oh, there's, there's places in Montana where you can. But it's really diverse. We're losing the diversity in the valleys as we're going from agriculture to um, residential, and we're getting pushed further into the mountains, but I found the mountain yards usually do better. Um, great, there's great pollen um, sources. If I had a better picture, I could show you nice pollen frames that are very multicolored. Is that enough? Sex? I mean, I could go on forever. It's, it's, it's mostly snowberry, um, what we call syringa or mock orange. Um, there's choke cherry, although they say that don't get a lot of um, nectar from them, but I do see them foraging. And the other big one is service berry. So probably service berry, snowberry are the two big ones, and syringa are the main ones that I'm aware of. I need to get some samples sent to a lab to have them analyzed. We have mountain maple, and I do believe the bees collect from them, but they're, they're more like a bush. They're not a tree. Okay. They're a shrub, kind of. Did some, you have a question or someone? I just want to say that I admire your persistence. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>